Sure thing. So I'm happy to be back. I know we spoke with you all uh, in February, back before we actually had a release out. Um, today we have uh, Trevor from the testing team, Louis, Mustafa, and Sharif from uh, Release Engineering, uh, Taylor from Infrastructure, Wale from Documentation, Scott and Robert from Security, and of course Greg and I'm Brian. Uh, so to start off, I'll go ahead and do the demonstrations that I was asked to do. So just do a quick video of a really basic Rocky install um, just to show how fast it can be done. One second. And one second, I have to enable screen sharing. Uh, one sec, I have to quit and rejoin to enable this. It's just a super basic Rocky install. You literally only have to do uh, one thing, well, two things. You just have to uh, allow the automatic partitioning, set up a password for either root or user, and let it rip. Brian, your computer is faster than mine. <laughs> And there you go. The uh, default software selection is server with GUI. So it's pretty much a uh, bare bones install, except that it also has GNOME. Greg, I think Rock is just faster than anything else out there, is what it is. Ah, that's, yep, yeah, I think so. Another uh, 
thing that we run into a lot or a question that we run into a lot are people that want to use different software selections with the minimal uh, installation or image. Um, so I made a, a quick demonstration of installing a workstation using the minimal image. The, uh, so the point here is that when you first use a minimal image, you'll only have the available, the packages that are available um, to install that comes on that image. So you won't have the full selection. All you have to do is enable networking, connected to the internet. Plug in the uh, repository URL. And now you'll have all the configurations available. What is the default uh, file system? XFS. Well, XFS on uh, LVM partitions. OK. Just curious. And Rocky is a perfectly adequate workstation distribution. We get a lot of questions about that as well. Um, there's a uh, plenty of software to do what you need to do. And finally, uh, the other thing I was asked about is how to do a migration. Um, so I have a video of doing a migration with CentOS. All you have to do is uh, download the script, run it, use the uh, dash R flag to confirm.
So migrating to Rocky is too easy. It works on CentOS, Oracle Linux, Alma Linux. Uh, I think that's all it's been tested on so far. Um, Mustafa, am I missing anything? No, I think it, it, it has been tested on Springdale also. I don't know if it's been tested on like actual rel. That part I'm kind of unsure about. I've been, I've been, I paid, I've been paying attention to it for the most part because of one of our main contributors who's been working on that script for us. Another question that we get pretty often is, uh, can I migrate uh, Enterprise Linux 7 to Rocky? Uh, the answer is no. Um, that you, you can't migrate EL7 to EL8 without uh, Leap which Leap, the tool itself, is open source, but it relies on a uh, corpus of data that takes an immense amount of effort to put together, um, which, and even with that information, it doesn't work entirely well all the time. So we've judged it to not be worth it at the moment to generate that. So last time we talked, we didn't have a release. Um, since then, we've uh, we've made a lot of progress. Of course, we've had two releases, uh, 8.3 and 8.4. We had the RC before 8.3. Uh, we've moved to a different uh, chat service. We now use our own service uh, called Mattermost or using Mattermost on chat.rockylinux.org. Uh, we have over 6,000 users uh, with 200 people in IRC that's bridged to that. Uh, we've done a lot of cool things. We've added errata to the, uh, uh, to the we've added errata information to the repositories. So you can do stuff like uh, DNF update info uh, which will show you information about the updates and or you can selectively install security updates and stuff like that. Uh, you've had over 300 around 300,000 uh, ISO downloads from the tier zero mirror. We've had let's see 20 million mirrorless queries. We've gained a a lot of large sponsors, including ARM, Fastly, Google, Mattermost, Microsoft, Montevista, Naver, and uh, Seagate. Uh, our community involvement is still going strong. We're adding lots of features. We're looking at things like uh, special interest groups. Let's see here. Actually, uh, Mustafa, did you want to talk more about the cool stuff that you can do with the uh, errata information? Yeah. The most requested feature was actually DNF update security. Uh, I think that was uh, that's probably the most important part for inc uh, the most important reason for including errata information uh, and uh, having. Uh, and I think using Foreman, using and getting mapping uh, of the raw information as well. And in addition to that, there's now a website where you can see all of that information. Let me drop it in the chat here. Uh, 
Uh, we've also added uh, arm builds. And I think Lewis is looking at PowerPC right now. That's a good call uh, to Trevor. The change logs or the kind of release notes that we have are updated when we uh, when we change when we push anything to prod. So you can check on that. And we're hoping to also uh, have some mailing lists and RSS feeds as well for that in the future. Uh, the other question that we get a lot is, is Rocky Linux actually production ready yet? Um, yes, it has been production ready since 8.3. It is ready to use. The, um, the migration tool is probably not the best thing to use on a production server, but uh, please do a clean install when you can, but it does work. And Greg can talk a little bit about the uh, organizational growth that we've experienced since February. Hey, everybody. So, uh, yeah, in terms of organizational growth, uh, maybe it makes sense to kind of give a little back uh, information as well. So when we first started uh, this project, um, due to the growth of the community, and, and what we were trying to do and the amount of interest that we had from organizations and sponsors, it became clear that we had to set up some sort of organizational structure to kind of help manage a lot of that. And that's exactly what we did. So we have the Linux, the Rocky Linux project, and then we created something called the Rocky Enterprise Software Foundation. Uh, the Enterprise Software Foundation has actually undergone a little bit of change since we started as you know we were kind of you know figuring out exactly what does it need to look like and how best are we going to deal with some of the mitigations or some of the issues that occurred um honestly with 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 centos back in the early days uh there was a number of things that that happened way back then that we really wanted to mitigate and fix such that we don't have the same sort of problems uh, we don't know if exactly <laughs> if we're going to be completely free and clear of problems, but we do have commitment to the community and a desire to uh, to really work with the community and make sure that we're solving all the problems as they as they basically come up. So we created uh, the Rocky Enterprise Software uh, Foundation as what's called a um, a B Corp, and a B Corp is a an organization that really exists for the public benefit. And it is, um, you know, it, we, we, are, we are not interested in profit. We are not interested in products. We are not interested in anything that a, a company would be interested in per se. Really our goal is to help organize, manage, and Organize, manage, and I think have our internet cut out as well.
He's, he's probably still talking and doesn't realize he went out. <laughs> <laughs> what else is new? Looks like Greg's power just went out. So let's see. Okay, I'm just gonna, uh, my name is uh, Wally. I'm Wally Shainka. I'm with the, uh, I serve in the documentation group for Rocky Linux. I'm just going to talk very slowly and fill in the blanks for uh, Greg until he comes back. Uh, his power did go up. Uh, so I, I think Greg was uh, going to start talking about the, uh, the the org structure and the reason why we made uh, the decisions that we did. Uh, you know, we had the choice of uh, uh, going for a nonprofit uh, setup. Is Greg back? I see GK. Okay. I see Greg. I see Greg here. Uh, yeah, so we had the, the we had the option to do that or go the uh, B Corp that he was starting to describe. Uh, Greg, so I'm just trying to see. If I, I, I think see. he's still disconnected. Yeah, he's not connected. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So overall, I, I think the I think what we where we came to was that yes, you can, you know, you can be a not for profit organization by name, and you know, you you still don't do, uh, you still don't do all the right things. You know, it's just a name, it's just a label. Uh, so we felt going the other route, uh, the B Corp route, would uh, force us and encourage us to do the right things and not be uh, and not just be a you know the the usual uh, FOSS project that's not for profit only by name, uh, and I think that's why we did that. Uh, I could say it, it may be easier to let Greg fill in when he gets back. Um, I know there was a lot of complicated stuff in there that talked with legalese and a whole bunch of stuff. Um, yeah, so maybe like, we can swing back to that. Looks like Greg's reconnected now. Good. Hi. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yep. Oh yep. man. Literally, like mid sentence, power goes out. My computer turns off. I'm like, uh, can you guys still hear me? <laughs> I didn't know if it went to sleep or what. But um, okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, Greg, so I started to fill in for you. This is Wally. I started to say the reason why we went the uh, non profit route. Uh, so you have to carry in from that point. You cannot go back now because that's what I've started to say. <laughs> What, this is like one of those impromptu games where somebody starts a sentence or a thought, and you have to go back and you know finish it. Um, so, so basically, uh, th there's a couple different perspectives on this. And uh, long story short, Centos and the organization behind Centos was a 501c3. Uh, that was what we were building towards. We had a we had a board that was being formed. We had all the organizational structure that was being formed around this. And CentOS was still able to be taken out of that 501c3 and go into a direction that actually for quite some time was not very gr good for the project. You could research this if you want to look for something called the CentOS debacle. And um, there's a couple keywords you can put in there in terms of people's names, but I'd rather not give anyone um, a, a black eye uh, about it any more than has already happened but there was uh, quite a bit of kind of politics and drama that occurred right after it left um, the 501c3. And so I wanted to create an organization that was not going to be subject to the same kind of issues that what we had initially with CentOS. Uh, not sure if we got it right, but you know, at this point, you know, we're, 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 it's it's at least different. We we think we've taken all the lessons learned from what happened in the past and turned that into something that's going to be positive. And we're still in the process of organizing ourselves. 
And so you're going to see more information in terms of uh, board of directors, in terms of organizational structure, decision-making process, um, how people are to be involved with management and leadership and so on and so forth. All of that is coming through the pipe now. Pike now, not pipe, pike now. Um, so uh, that's in progress. And uh, we're hoping to have all of that sort of released here in the next couple months. Uh, but that is what we're diligently working through right now from the non-technical point uh, perspective. On the technical perspective, and I think we've already talked about this a little bit, uh, we're looking at uh, finishing up the secure boot. Uh, every time I've given a date on how long we think this is going to take, um, I end up putting my foot in my mouth because I get the date way off. I'm going to stop giving dates uh, with the hope that I stop become I stop being wrong <laughs> on them. So uh, secure boot is on its way. Uh, you can follow the progress in terms of the, the the GitHub issues and whatnot that have been placed around this. So you can follow all of that. Uh, the team, Sharif and, and and others, have just been doing a fantastic job with it, and it is you know there's there's a lot to it. Uh, so hopefully that'll come soon. And then after we get Secure Boot done, we are going to really start diving deeply into. Um, the special interest groups. And special interest groups is where we're hoping to have a lot more help from the community and interaction from the community. Uh, this is where we're going to be further extending the operating system. The, the way that we think about it is that um, the enterprise Linux base that we are, um, that we've, we've created and, and, and are compatible with now, uh, that's gonna become this stable foundation of which we can build on top of to add additional features and capabilities for various different verticals and industry um, and, and needs. So uh, as an example, there's, there's gonna be a SIG for uh, laptops and desktops. There's gonna be a SIG for high performance computing for hyperscale uh, among a variety of other areas. Uh, so we are hoping again to have more involvement uh, with the community on these different SIGs. Um, embedded SIG is another one. Uh, we already have a organization who has volunteered to to lead the embedded SIG called um, Monta Vista. And uh, so we, we are getting involved in involvement from industry and individuals on SIGs, but we've not jumped forward on that yet because we want to finish the secure boot before we get into that. Uh, so that's really kind of the order of operations in terms of what you're going to see next. Uh, we have um, some initiatives also in terms of facilitating the build infrastructure. Uh, the build infrastructure that we've created is fairly complicated. And that was a necessity because we wanted to be as close to what it is that we know um, in terms of the Fedora and Red Hat build infrastructure. So we wanted to mirror that as closely as we possibly could. Uh, and we found a lot of areas, a number of areas in which we really want to um, to optimize that build system. And so we're gonna be working on that here shortly and um, providing all of those all those capabilities and optimizations, of course, back to the community. It is our belief that uh, all, all the software, everything that we're doing in every piece of Rocky should not only be open source, but it should be uh, documented and reproducible. Uh, one area that we want to build confidence in the community is that uh, all of this can be redone. And we want to ensure that all of this can be redone. So uh, if somebody either wants, thinks they can do a better job than we are, we want them to be able to take all the documentation, everything that we've done and go off and, and do it. And it is our opinion that it, that would be good for the community. Uh, we want to ensure that everybody has a absolutely stable foundation in terms of the operating system that, uh, that they need to be running on. We personally like the enterprise Linux standard as that base. And I think, again, the way to really get that um, level of uh, confidence uh, is, is to ensure that not only do you have you know, one great solution to do this, but you could potentially have any number of great solutions to do this because we're open sourcing and we're making this as absolutely transparent as possible. So that's really where our focus is and, and what our goal is. We've had a couple of um, people speak to us about uh, potentially bringing other open source projects into the Rocky Enterprise Software Foundation, other organizations and other people that have similar beliefs and, and just to kind of articulate what that belief and what that vision is. 
is that open source should be should be free. It should be community, and um, and that's really what we're about. We're about making it such that uh, organizations can have confidence in their open source projects that they're relying on and not have to worry about uh, a, a business model or conflict of interest on the corporate side to actually you know, do something that would be negative to that open source community. We've seen this a number of times, not only with, with Red Hat and CentOS, we have seen this uh, uh, more recently with Elasticsearch. And if you go back through the cloud world or into the cloud world, uh, over the past, you know, three plus years, I think starting all the way back with MongoDB was one of the first that really did this, but then there's been probably about a dozen since then. So we really want to kind of bring the focus of open source uh, back to the community and not make it around a business model, not making it around uh, something that may have a conflict of interest with a business decision. Uh, and the way to do that is not to have one big successful company um, behind an open source project, but to have a lot of big successful companies <laughs> behind open source projects. And that is why you're going to see sponsors and partners like what we have, uh, where you can, you can see as an example, we've got AWS, we've got Azure and Google, all primary partners or principal partners in what it is that we're doing. Uh, they are there to not only ensure our success, but ensure also that we stay neutral between all vendors. And that is kind of in our design goals of what it is we're creating. And thus, we kind of build an inherent level of stability with that with this organization and this project. So I've kind of blabbed for a while. I don't know if I'm blabbing too much. So uh, I, I tend to just kind of keep talking as soon as I get the mic. So I'm going to pause for a moment, see if there's any questions or any areas in which we can, uh, where we can focus. So to expand on your shim stuff, Greg, at this point, and I don't know if Sharif is on, but um, at this point, we have it in review with the shim signing committee and we're waiting on them. As long as I'm not giving the estimation, because I've given like three estimates on, on when I think it's going to be ready, and every one of them now I've been wrong on. Uh, yeah. we hit At this point, it's completely out of our hands as to when the SHIM signing committee gets to it. OK. I, I agree completely. Are there any questions um, or areas that you'd like us to talk further on or focus on? Uh, this may not be of interest to everybody here, but I'm just going to ask just for our, my own organization. We're a CentOS shop and have been for, you know, 15 something years or however long. And uh, with the whole uh, settling out of, uh, of, of CentOS and now Rocky and Alma and, and everything else, we, we've had to make some decisions about where to go in the future. And I'm asked on the regular basis, what's the difference between Rocky, Alma are going for Red Hat, obviously knowing the costs. And, and I don't always have really good information. Do you guys have a place somewhere or a link that would, that would give a good differentiation uh, between you guys and let's say uh, Alma, I'll give as an example, but anybody uh, so that I can, I can start doing my research and giving cogent answers in these meetings? So the, the long story short of this is, and, and honestly, it shouldn't matter if if we all do our job well, whether this is Alma, whether this is Rocky, whether this is Navy or Springdale or, or Oracle or, or Red Hat. These are all enterprise Linux variants. And when I say enterprise Linux variants, let, let me give a little bit of background on my perspective on this. For pretty much the life of CentOS, uh, almost the entire life, CentOS uh, was basically a copy of, of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And Red Hat Enterprise Linux development was happening behind locked doors of Red Hat. So we would basically take, once Red Hat released something, we would basically go to, whether that be Red Hat Network or, or an FTP server, wherever those source RPMs were actually available to, we would go there, we would download those and then try to convert those source RPMs into a working Linux distribution. And the goal again is to be as compatible with Red Hat Enterprise Linux as we possibly could be. Now. This is the way it's been for, well, most of the life of CentOS. 
just recently, uh, mm-hmm. in December of last year, recently, yeah. CentOS shift, shift, shifted focus. And this may be knowledge to everybody already, but just to kind of set set um, everybody at the same point, Red Hat switched, you know, and, and CentOS switched kind of the emphasis of, of CentOS. And instead of trailing behind Red Hat, they actually moved in front of it. And this is a huge benefit to the community and to everybody, to us, to, to all of the enterprise Linux variants, because all of a sudden the development now is happening more in the open. It's no longer happening strictly behind locked doors of Red Hat. And this is a fantastic thing because it gives us as well as other people the ability to to contribute back in a more open and friendly way. So we love this, we love the switch. Now the problem isn't the switch. The problem was that enterprise, excuse me, that CentOS was was end of life. But if you, honestly, if you you ask me and personally, uh, it's my opinion, that this is actually a, a positive move for the community. Because what just happened was CentOS, and I'm not gonna beat around the bush on this, and if there's anybody from Red Hat or the CentOS team that listens to this that feels otherwise, I'd, I'd be open to debate this or, or to be told I'm wrong, but CentOS competes with Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Anyone who says that it doesn't, um, I would be skeptical of, right? The two are solving the same problem. And so there's a conflict of interest there having Red Hat running CentOS. Uh, I, I think that that was a, a mistake personally for Red Hat to have, have taken that on, but there's a conflict of interest there. Now there's no more conflict of interest from the Red Hat side. Red Hat is putting into the open source community via CentOS stream, which is a great thing. We now have multiple community efforts that are truly community and independent from Red Hat that are now taking from the same sources that Red Hat is using to build Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And we are now leveraging that to create more enterprise Linux variants. So uh, in a matter of speaking, CentOS has now all of a sudden just become our parent and Red Hat Enterprise Linux has now just become our sibling. Even though we look at enterprise Red Hat Enterprise Linux as kind of the golden standard of, of what we want to be compatible with, we're basically now peers. We're, we're, we're siblings to Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And there are more siblings to Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And it is because of that, that I believe that this is actually a really good shift. So, um, so Brandon, I think it was you asking the question, if uh, now there, there is a decision to make, what enterprise Linux variant do you wish to use? But to be completely clear, it really shouldn't matter, right? What should matter is well, at least not from a technology perspective. If we've all done our job correctly, it shouldn't matter. But- A big if. Yeah, <laughs> okay, fair point. Um, but what should matter are kind of some of the non-technicals about it, the community, the adoption, uh, who's using it, um, uh, what is the commitment to the community? Uh, if there's any sort of you know past experience or legacy involved in the project, all of these things I personally think are, are important to making a decision. But worst case scenario with whichever one you go with, the risk is, in, is exceedingly low because you can switch between them fairly easily, right? If you choose to go with, with one version and you find that at some point you wish to change, I mean, it is a lift, but it's not an impossible lift to switch. So if something happens to the project, something happens to the org, or you just choose that something else is going better, you can make that shift. And again, because we're all completely compatible in, in theory with each other, uh, it, it should be a simple lift to move from one to the other. Now, uh, again, I, I would I, I would stress that uh, the, the the community should be really uh, making these decisions and 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 kind of just pushing on you know which ones ones plural which ones are going to be community accepted, and um, we hope to be one of those. Uh, we hope to do, you have our commitment that we're going to do the best that we can in terms of, of management and taking on this responsibility um, as, as uh, reasonably as we possibly can and honestly as we possibly can. It's our commitment to the community to make sure that this is going to be around, that we are emulating the best build practices that we can. We're working with commercial organizations and enterprises to ensure that we have the security uh, accreditations to to um, to basically meet their needs. This goes all the way from U.S. federal government. Uh, my, my experience and my background is in U.S. Uh, federal. 
Uh, so it's going all the way through U.S. federal and all of the capabilities uh, from a security and compliance perspective that U.S. federal needs and requires going all the way through enterprises and organizations that are also leveraging things uh, like like FIPS, um, uh, you know, the, the STIGs and um, uh, CIS, among other things. So there, there's a number of areas where we're where we're trying to do as best as we possibly can, trying to give people the capabilities and the confidence in terms of the operating system that uh, that they need to make a decision. But again, in the end, it's an extremely low risk because if something happens to, to us, you can choose one of multiple locations for another operating system, including another group just like us coming along and taking where we've left off and going and creating the next, the next version. This enterprise Linux standard, which is what I like to describe this as now, is uh, solidified by having optionality. And we th feel as though that that optionality is exceedingly important. That's good. Thank you for the info. Absolutely. Are there any more questions? <laughs> I've got a beer here with me. So the more I drink, the more I'm going to talk. So you guys should ask some questions for sure. <laughs> The question that's most important in this case is what kind of beer? Oh, I'm a cheap date, Brandon. I'm drinking Stella. That works. <laughs> I, still, yeah, I, I still need to send you my uh, my peanut butter porter. At some oh, point. oh, we, we, we can have a whole nother discussion on that. But what are you drinking, Lewis? <laughs> that does not I'm just, I'm just, I'm just drinking water. I, um, it's too early for me to start drinking. So you're an hour ahead of me, so I don't want to hear it. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> All right. Anything else that I could, um, that I can blab on? I'm going to open up to the rest of my team then. Uh, anyone on the Rocky side that wishes to add any additional context on anything or, um, you know, share anything that they're currently working on or anything that they are super excited about? So I, I guess like, I guess I could like speak a little bit. Um, so like one of the things that I've been kind of working on on the side since, you know, most things are, you know, for the most part, things are, you know, things have kind of leveled out and I, I got time to, to, to think about things and such like that. Um, I'm currently working on some, I'm currently working on, I, I, I know the name sounds ridiculous, but like one of the things I've been working on is I call it lazy builder because the whole idea is I, I want to give uh, people the ability to like, you know, build stuff reproducibly. Obviously we recommend people to use mock. We recommend people to do, um, you know, follow the Fedora packaging guidelines because that's, that's kind of like the gold standard for the most part. Um, and so my lazy builder does do that. And so kind of one of the things I was w looking at was like, okay, how can I make something that, that, you know, the community can use to, you know, build certain things by themselves without, you know, getting too complicated. So for those who know, and, and at least in enterprise Linux eight, you know, the app stream modularity thing came around and the complicated part about that is actually building the modules and doing that correctly. So part of the thing I'm making is allowing people to make local modules because to some people that's actually important. Um, especially the, the first person I can think of, his name is Ramey. He did a lot of PHP work and his stuff is widely used for the most part. And he does custom modules all the time. So, and so I, it kind of got me thinking like, okay, well he did it. Well, we had to figure out how to do modules ourselves. Well, we want to make that process easier. You know, we, we, 
you know, we all lot there was a lot of the a lot of the stuff that we're doing in our current build system is complicated. And yeah, I think no matter what, there's gonna be complexity. But I wanna try to make it easier for people to build modules locally and do stuff like kind of on on their own or to get an idea of how this stuff works. So I'm currently building some tools to facilitate that and 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 help with that. And I and I hope it actually gets I hope I actually hope it gets used. Um it's it's actually kind of a neat thing. It it currently does build, you know, packages and it makes repositories, it transfers them, it does some it does some neat stuff. The modules mostly work, but of course, then I decided to refactor things and then that broke. So of course I'm having to redo all that, which you know it's it it's not Linux if you're not having to, you know, fix something you broke, right? So um I'm personally looking forward to it for, you know, the community to use and the community to provide feedback or even help improve it. Cause I know it's not going to be perfect. So that's kind of something I've been working on personally. And then I know, uh, you know, as a whole for release engineering, we're, we're looking at, like I alluded to, you know, trying to redo kind of the build system and come up with something better and, and all that, but there's, there's always going to be complexity, but I think, I think Mustafa can actually elaborate a little further on some of that stuff if he if he has a moment or if he wishes to. But that's kind of what I've been working on, and I I hope to present it to the community soon. Yeah, that is super cool, Lewis. That there's there's, uh, you know, it's funny. Um, when we first built CentOS, right, it, it was it was kind of a different world back then. And um, when I started to understand what this team was building from an infrastructure perspective in order to build the operating system, I realized that my knowledge was way outdated, <laughs> to say the least. It is no longer as easy as it as it used to be to I don't even want to call it easy, but I'm putting air quotes around this. But it's not as easy as it used to be to build the operating system. Uh, it's not basically like you can just do a bunch of you know uh, RPM build loops in, in in various true root environments and building those true root environments up, which is what we used to do. Uh, it is it is very different now, especially when you look at RPM modularity. Uh, which is a fantastic, it's a tremendous tool from the user perspective. But when you look at how to actually build that properly, there's a lot that goes into that. So uh, the work that Lewis is doing uh, has been just tremendous in terms of simplifying that and and making that barrier of entry easier for, for additional people to kind of get into this, uh, become packagers, uh, become uh, special interest group maintainers. And, and again, for somebody to come along and, and redo the work that we've done. I think there was a, there, there was a question from, from Michael, um, in addition to the, uh, the peanut butter porter, <laughs> which is, um, uh, is RESF currently or will they soon produce an official AWS GCP Azure uh, set of machine images? And the answer is yes. So the AWS machine image is there, the GCP machine image is there, and Azure we are still working with in terms of getting everything out there. Um, but yes, those images are for the most part up there for at least AWS and GCP. Uh, we've been talking about how do we properly advertise those machine images because if you were to search in AWS for Rocky Linux as an example, you're going to get over 200 responses. So finding the official one is um, requires a little bit of uh, detective work and to figure out who is it being sold by, where is it from, and I'm putting sold again with my air quotes around it, uh, or distributed by is probably a better way of describing it, but AWS terminology is sold by, but where is it coming from and whatnot. Uh, I know we've been talking about adding this to our download page, uh, direct links to the AMIs. Uh, does anybody on the Rocky team know if that has happened yet or what the status on that is? Brian? Do you know? So, yes, we have the official AMIs and GCP images. We do not have official uh, Azure images yet. 
No, I mean, is it on the career? We were talking about putting him on the download page. Oh, no, that issue is still open. I think uh, Hayden is trying to figure out a page design to make that look nice. Got it. Got it. Okay. Also, uh, I, I just want to add for, for Google Cloud, we're actually officially supported. So it's not on the marketplace, but rather when you go to Compute Engine, you can directly start a new instance with uh, Rocky 8. So Trevor, you mentioned um, potentially doing a show and tell. Um, are you back? Are you here? I just got back in. Hopefully I can share my screen. We'll find out in a second. <laughs> okay. One of, one of the and things that I wanted to mention um, along the lines similar to what Lewis was talking about is some of the work that we've been doing to try to um, shore up the uh, infrastructure for the build and test um, stuff. And so I'm one of the co-leads of the testing slash QA group. And one of the things that we've been working on is creating automated testing environments so we can basically uh, pre-test and pre-flight all the ISOs that the release engineering guys build also be able to do tests of the updates in an automated fashion. And so we've been working on that for the past few weeks and we're using an uh, open source tool called OpenQA. It's developed by um, SUSE. And um, I can kind of show you a little bit of a show and tell of that because we're getting some good stuff happening with that right now. Let's see if the screen sharing part works. Um, can you see my screen, the window? Yeah, we can yeah. see it. So um, this is a dev instance just running in a VM on my local machine here, but this is OpenQA running on Fedora 34 um, that's been configured to do tests for Rocky. Um, currently some of the, the ISOs that we have. And so if you Google OpenQA, you can find the Fedora one, you can find the SUS one, you can look a bit more at that. But you know we've got work happening now where we're building tests for these. And if I drop you into a test that I just ran um, last night, you can see that um, what we do is we basically test like ISO configs or minimal installs. and the configuration will trigger a whole bunch of builds automatically and then kick off some some um, staged builds off of the, the queue cows that it will generate. And kind of what that looks like in the tool is basically a whole bunch of screen grabs that we have to match against and then text tests as well. Um, and it's quite involved to get this working for our installer because graphically it's a bit different what this does is do does graphical testing, comparing what's on screen with what it calls a needle. And, and you actually have to have a direct graphical match of the text that you're looking for on these screens for them to pass and for you to continue along. Once you resolve um, the differences between the Fedora installer um, and the Rocky installer, um, a lot of the stuff just works out of the box. So it's pretty cool. Um, it gets into the things that we really want to do, like doing a uh, firewall configuration testing or different kinds of uh, um, drive formatting testing. Um, again, some of these will have to be worked out because the tests themselves are written for <clears throat> Fedora. And so things like doing tests for modules um, are specific currently for Fedora modules that are in the default installs. And our uh, modules are different depending on um, the package set that you have. But we're making good progress on this. Um, you know, we have minimal, um, completely 100% passing now with, with our version of the source, and we're working on some of the other builds. And so that's looking really good because we'll be able to take the ISOs that um, Lewis and Mustafa build um, and be able to test those before we even release those out to anyone else. So this is really cool. And that's probably it for the share, if I can figure out how to turn that off. Yeah, so I'm done with that little bit to show you guys. And, and we have a number of people on the team. Actually, just I was over in the Slack before I came over here where one of um, our newest uh, team members had just uh, confirmed that they were able to, to build up their test box and, and do all this testing um, themselves. And so we've been moving this over into the infrastructure for Rocky, and it will become kind of the, the thing that we use for all of our testing once it's hooked into our Koji and our build environment.
And uh, to answer Brandon's question in the chat, or not question, but comment about uh, trying to run Rocky on uh, M1 or on an M1 Mac, that will not work at the moment, or at least with the stock kernel. Gotcha. Thank you. You saved me a little bit of time in testing. Actually, I'm not sure of what distros would run on the M1 at the moment. I, I got one of them, but it wasn't you guys. So I'm kind of curious, uh, how many people here that, that's not the Rocky Linux crew uh, have, have tried Rocky? Sounded like Brandon, you may have. Uh, yeah, I did it just on a like an Intel machine as a, like a workstation as a test uh, because I like to try it as a workstation, uh, and that was about it. Though I haven't done it in any VMs or in our VMware in infrastructure yet. Got it. Got it. Everything go well? If I recall, yes. This was a a, a little while ago. I, I have to reproduce it again to to remember anything if I didn't write it down. <laughs> totally understood. Cool. Anyone else um, been playing with it and testing it? Anyone currently um, on CentOS and looking to shift to another solution, another Linux distro? Yeah, that's me again. <laughs> Anyone else? John, did I see you nod? Yeah, I'll probably do that at some point. Got it. And um, do you have any special requirements for the environment in which you're you're running in? Like you're using any GPUs or any other drivers or commercial applications? No, no. Got it. We've seen a lot of interest from people that are in fact using uh, commercial um, bits uh, and we've gotten a lot of requests to work with various vendors. And so we've got a number of ISVs as well as IHVs that we're working with right now, really to just ensure that Rocky has the appropriate support going through entirely through the stack for all sorts of different use cases. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're having good luck talking with vendors and whatnot, but I'm also, I'm always looking for additional uh, vendors that we can reach out to and be proactive in terms of working with them. and. Um, uh, really just to make sure that everything is running properly and that we get proper support. Is there anybody here that is uh, running their Linux distribution considering, even if you're not actually considering another, uh, another alternative to CentOS, but is there anyone who is using commercial applications uh, or, or drivers or, or hardware, anything that they need to be integrating into their system that we should be thinking about. Uh, Michael just wrote in chat, uh, this team is evaluating CentOS, CentOS alternatives and yay, Rocky Linux is leading the choice. Fantastic, Michael. All right, so it sounds like this is a pretty kind of standard, <clears throat> uh, straightforward group in terms of uh, Linux requirements, which which obviously always makes it easier uh, easier to deal with. But yeah, if there's anybody who's watching this this video afterwards or on the YouTube side, uh, and they have kind of special requirements for their Linux system, whether that be architecture, whether that be add-in cards, physical hardware. Uh, laptops going all the way through software applications and whatnot we'd really love to hear from you and uh, uh just to put out a quick plug um you can contact us and you can get onto our matter most server by going to chat.rockylinux.org and um and, and joining over there it's easy to get an account once you've joined you you're literally in the same communication system that we are all in and uh, we'd love to hear from you, love to talk to you. If you have any specific questions, problems, anything, we have a fantastic community. I think as, as Brian mentioned, there's there's over 6,000 people uh, in that matter most. Um, 
funny story, we actually migrated to Mattermost because we outgrew our Slack instance by a lot. Uh, so we had about 10,000 people in our Slack instance um, and that grew in about two months. And um, at that rate, we weren't able to retain any messages uh, through Slack because we, we weren't paying for it. It was the free tier and the free tier only allows you to have 10,000 messages before they drop off. So you can imagine with 10,000 people, right? That's, that's basically each one of them saying one thing and then everything goes away. Uh, so we ended up having to move off. We've moved on to Mattermost. Uh, if anybody has not checked out Mattermost yet, please do so. Uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic platform. Uh, it's an, basically, it's an open source Slack-like alternative. And uh, we've, we've had really good success with it. And we use it to kind of, <coughs> excuse me, to keep track and, and, uh, of communication and whatnot with the community and with each other. Uh, so uh, Mattermost has been fantastic. We also have a bridge to IRC. So if you're already on um, uh, the Libera chat network, um, please feel free just to join one of the Rocky Linux channels. They are bridged into our Mattermost. So wherever you're at, we can chat. And um, yeah, again, we just love to hear from you. Love to hear how things are going and, um, and whatnot. Oh, also, if you're interested in special interest group development, please also uh, reach out to us. Uh, that's going to be, as I said before, that's going to be kicked off here shortly and hopefully, knock on wood, hopefully it will be shortly as soon as we finish with our secure boot. So, um, uh, yeah. Are there any other, I keep asking if there's any other questions because I want to make sure that we're, we're getting to everything. Uh, but if there aren't any other questions, uh, it's, it's been a pleasure to, to, talk, to speak with everybody. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the invite. So I'm going to chime in again. I'm sorry about this. Uh, this is about Mattermost, really, and you guys are not Mattermost. But uh, did you put your Mattermost instant, instance, I'm sorry, in-house, or is it all uh, hosted elsewhere? Because our, our one of my use cases is, is that we, we need to keep things mostly in-house when it comes to this. And I've been trying to convince people that um, we should get away from Slack and go in-house, and it's Mattermost something you guys have found uh, really easy to implement for your, you know, chat purposes. Yeah, I can, I can jump in there. I, I found it um, super easy, <laughs> honestly. As someone who's run other chat platforms for companies in the past, it was really easy to set up. Uh, we run it in a clustered mode, um, so there is a bit of high availability there. Um, it's, it's very light on resources. So I'm continuously surprised with how little CPU this thing comes along with. Um, it's been great from my perspective. Cool. I'll look at it. Thanks. And I, I guess from my point of view, um, at least from the Mattermost perspective, I, I found that like if, if there's like integrations or there's plugins or there's scripts that like, you know, that say like, oh, they're for Slack or whatever, you know, like bot messages and stuff. I found that they work with Mattermost without having to change much. Like I've, I've, I've had some really good luck where, um, where the Mattermost API that, you know, it, it, if you send it something that like, you know, you would send to Slack, it'll accept it and it'll do what you expect it to do. So I've actually had some pretty good luck with that. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions come up. And um, so I'm gonna hand the mic back over to, um, to Jerry and say thank you again. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, to speak with everybody. Oh, there is one, there's one more question that just came up. <laughs> uh, uh, Jamie asks, uh, can we comment on our financial support and how do we pay for all of this? Absolutely. So we have, we have the concept of two types of engagement that we have with um, with the various enterprises and organizations. There's sponsorships and there's partnerships. Sponsorships is a direct uh, uh, monetary contribution to the project. We have different tiers of sponsorships, as you can see on the website. 
and we've had a number of organizations that have been um, very proactive and helpful in terms of uh, making sure that we have everything that we need, <coughs> excuse me, to be successful. Uh, then we have the notion of partnerships and partnerships is basically everything that's not uh, a monetary investment. Anything else that an organization is doing in order to help our success as a project. So you'll see Fastly there, you'll see Matter Most there, you'll see um, a, a number of organizations, Arm is there and whatnot. So those are organizations that are helping us from the, uh, from either, you know, uh, project perspective or offering us capabilities or, or free services or, um, or whatnot. So that's the differences on partnerships versus sponsorships for organizations. And lastly, we do have the ability for individuals to contribute to the project in two ways. Uh, they can actually just, you know, contribute like, like labor can volunteer their time and whatnot. And that is um, absolutely appreciative. And we're very grateful to all the contributors that we have. And, and there are a lot of them. So please do come in and be patient as we are still organizing ourselves. Uh, but there's also the possibility for people to do donations. So individuals can also donate. I think the average donation is probably about 50 to hundred dollars um, that we get, but you know, there's no limit in donation in terms of small or large size. Uh, we've had, we have people give $5 quite often. And we have people also give, you know, a few hundred dollars quite often. So um, there's, there's no limit. Um, but if, if somebody's thinking of doing thousands of dollars, um, I would encourage them instead to really, you know, volunteer time uh, instead. Uh, I know thousands of dollars for individuals, usually for most people like myself is a lot of money. So uh, in, in that particular case, you know, we'd love to have time commitments, volunteers and that sort of stuff. Um, honestly, even, even more than the capital, uh, at, at that point. So with all that said, um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much how we pay for it. Uh, we don't have a huge amount of expenses thanks to all the partnership that we do have in place, but we are setting ourselves up for the fact that at some point we do want to be able to, um, uh, pay for things, pay for development, pay for uh, time on the, on the project. And if we do ever need to do things like pay for our CDN or other things, we're hoping to have a little bit of a, of a buffer there, a financial buffer that we can do that. And again, the whole point of this is sustainability. And the last point I'll make mention on this regarding the finances is we are going to be doing uh, third party audits of our bookkeeping and then publishing a uh, financial summaries, uh, kind of like a, um, uh, pro rata or something of our, of our finances of, of where's the money going, what are we doing with the money and, and have that done by a third party auditor. Uh, and we're probably going to be releasing those at, at periodic intervals. So far we haven't done one. Um, there hasn't been many requests for one, but that's something we want to be proactive on. So that should be coming down here pretty, um, pretty soon. Uh, if anyone is interested in a corporate sponsorship or a partnership, please do uh, email us uh, at sponsors at rockylinux.org or resf.org or partners at rockylinux or resf.org. <laughs> Brandon, I like your comment. Uh, Brandon says he'll keep it in mind for the what the heck do we do now? And um, we, we, do hope to be a be an option there, Brandon. So if you if you have any further questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Otherwise, just join our matter most, be part of what we're doing, and uh, you know we got your back. All Thank right. you, will do. <laughs> Thanks, Brandon. Uh, great to meet everyone again. And and Jerry, I, I think you're the MC on this, so I'm going to hand the mic back over to you and just say thank you on behalf of the team. It's been uh, a pleasure to speak with everybody. Okay, thank you, Greg, uh, Brian, Mustafa, mm -hmm. and going to find the list, I guess, Trevor. And uh, Lewis Abel. Uh, so it's been very, very informative. I wish we had more people on here, but you know, you never know for these meetings. Mm -hmm. I feel like 
when we did this last time, there were so many people too. There was there was quite a few. Yeah. Yeah, but it wasn't August no, we, vacation week for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Yeah. From our perspective, it, it's, you know, we're happy to talk. It doesn't matter if it's for one person or a hundred people. Uh, you know, you, you, you got you got our time, you got our attention, and it's a pleasure to be able to share with y'all what we're doing. Uh, if you ever want us to come back and talk again, uh, you know how to reach us, and we are always happy to come back. Okay, thanks, Greg. Really appreciate it, and it's a very, very informative talk. Yeah, thanks, Greg. So I guess we can call it a night now. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.